John chapter 6, we'll be looking at verse 47 through verse 41 this morning. John 6, 47 through, 41, 47 through 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that way no one may eat of it, so that way one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Let's pray and then we'll take apart uh, this morning's text. Father, this morning, our, the songs that we have sang have really focused in on the gospel, have focused in on your work, on the, on the work of Jesus on the cross and all that he accomplished for us. And again, as we look at this, these, these couple of verses, we are again focusing this morning on the gospel. So Father, I pray right now, if there's anyone in here who is not regenerate, who is not a Christian, that you would use this message to convict them to draw them to yourself, to effectually call them. But Father, for, for those of us who are believers, I pray that you would, you would use this text, this incredible reminder of the, the great gospel and the things that you've accomplished for us to encourage our hearts and give us reason to celebrate. Make your message clear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So far in this magnificent Bread of Life discourse, we're now three messages into just the Bread of Life Discourse. Like I said earlier, we've been in chapter 6 for quite some time. We may end at chapter 6 with 10 messages in chapter 6. I'm not, I'm not quite sure yet of the math. But here we are, three messages in to the Bread of Life Discourse. It's the Bread of Life Part 3. And here's where we're at. This is, this is where, if you're taking notes, this is where, we, where, where we've been at and where we're at today. We started off a couple weeks ago looking at Jesus, your satisfaction in John 6, verse 34 through 36, the truth, the reality that your fulfillment, your, your longings, your satisfaction, your delight, your joy, all of that is in Christ. All of that yearning that you experience, all of that reaching for something, all of that is Christ. He's your satisfaction. We saw Jesus as the bread of life in verse 37 through 40. He is your security. Uh, those who are truly saved cannot lose their salvation. They're held in God's hand. We saw in verse 41 and 42, Jesus is your sympathy. Uh, he knows how to sympathize with you. He knows the pain of rede rejection. He himself experienced the sting of rejection from not only his nation, from his people, his own hometown, but from his very own family. They themselves did not believe in who he was. We saw last time, uh, Jesus is your surety. Uh, Jesus is the reason why you are saved. No one comes to the Father except through the Son, and no one goes to the Son apart from the Father's drawing. We looked at the doctrine of effectual calling or prevenient grace, depending on how you want to define it. And it's the reality of John 6, 44, that no one comes to the Father apart, from, or no one comes to the Son apart from the Father's drawing. We looked at that, that really incredible teaching last time. And if you're taking notes, we're, we're on point five today. Point five. We have one point that we are covering today, and that is Jesus, your salvation. Jesus, your salvation. And that's going to be verse 47 through 51. The Jewish crowds are, at this point, growing increasingly agitated at Jesus in the hard truths he's teaching them. You remember, this is the crowd that followed Jesus from, the, from uh, Capernaum out and, and the other cities around the Sea of Galilee. They heard him teach. They had their sick healed by him. They, had, they were miraculously fed, for him, fed by him. And then he went away to pray into the mountain. He sent his disciples away. Then this crowd eventually dispersed. They go back into the cities. They go back around the Sea of Galilee back into Capernaum, and there they, they await for him. Or rather, they, the, the, the next day they, they look for him, he's not there, so then they make their way back to Capernaum, and there they find him. So they're, they're wanting more food. They're wanting Jesus to do more miracles for them. They're, they're looking at Jesus as being this genie of a figure, this person who is going to really provide for them 
do shows for them, but more than that, literally just give them food to eat. That's all they're interested in here. And so they go to Jesus. They're expecting more miracles. They're, they're demanding more miracles. They're demanding to be fed again, and they're not really getting their way with Jesus. He's not giving them more food. He's not healing their sick. He's not performing for them. He's teaching them, and they're getting annoyed. And we, as we saw last time, they're now at the point where they're grumbling, and they're expressing their disdain in Jesus. They're, they went from view, calling him curious, uh, Lord, sir, um, and now they're calling him this man. Like the disrespect is real. They're, they're growing saltier by the minute. That They say, is, is this not the son of Joseph? Is this not Mary's son? How can he say he is from heaven? Who on earth does this guy think he is? How dare you? We know who you are. We know who you are. How dare you say you come from heaven? And in response, we saw last time, Jesus tells them that no one goes to the Father except through the Son, and no one comes to the Son apart from the Father's drawing. This is the reason why they do not understand Him, because they have not been drawn by Him. But Jesus isn't finished. He tells them that if they were truly of, if they were truly of God, if God was truly their, their Father, they would understand what He was telling them because true children understand his teaching. Look with me at the verse that we ended with last time, uh, John chapter 6, and you look with me at verse 40, uh, 45. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Verse 46, not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Jesus tells these people, You're not of God because if you were of God, you would have been taught of God. You would have understood. You would have understood my teaching. You don't. Therefore, you are not of God. And in verse 47 in our text this morning, Jesus continues. So look with me at your Bible, John 6, 47. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Jesus begins by saying, truly, truly. He, he, he wants them to understand that what he is telling them is reality. It's true. It's true truth. It's, it's, he's trying to emphasize here, this is truly true. Truly, truly. You, you can count on what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is reality. Take it to the bank. It's how things work really are. You, you, in other, you had better listen. I'm telling you something that is true. And what Jesus here tells them in verse 47, for verse 47 really is the essence of the bread of life discourse. Uh, realistically, this, this originally was taught by Jesus in one sitting. It wasn't like they broke it up over two months you know, like we're doing, and we're just taking little pieces, and we're, we're explaining it. No, Jesus taught them this in one sitting, and all of the bread of life discourse is working to this verse, to verse 47. And it's this reality that he is their salvation. He's already told them that they will only find satisfaction in him. They will only find their fulfillment in him. All of their longings will be fulfilled in him. He's already told them that he's their security. We already have seen in their rejection of him that he is our sympathy. And now Jesus is telling these people in the clearest possible way that he is their salvation. The gloves are off. The parables are aside. He is telling them, I am the bread of life. And truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Life. He is telling these people, I am your salvation. And for us in 2019, he's telling us, I am your salvation. And notice what Jesus says here. He says, whoever believes has eternal life. This word believe is crucial to our understanding of, of not only this text, but the entire, the entire gospel itself. As you know, as we, we've talked about many times now, the entire purpose 
of John's gospel, John 20, 31. These things are written, John 20, 30 and 31. These things, this book, everything in it is written so that way you may believe and believing have life in his name. It's crucial that we understand the nature of belief. To believe fundamentally means that it is excluding good works from the process of salvation. All the religions in the world, pick, take, pick your poison. Any one of them, apart from Christianity, teaches salvation by works in some way. Either do this good deed and you will be saved, you'll go to heaven, do, have your good outweigh your bad, and then God will say, oh, I'll let you in. Whatever, pick your poison. All of them in some way teach that you do things in order to be saved, but not Christianity. That's not the gospel message. The gospel message is you fundamentally cannot do anything to earn your salvation. The good that you do, Jesus, or God says, it's repulsive to me. It says dirty rags. And if you really want to be disgusted, the Hebrew there is, uh, is rags that women use to clean, clean themselves during their period. Like that's how God views people thinking that they're going to earn their heaven or earn their way to heaven by good works. Hebrew is very crass language, by the way. Our, our English translations clean it up a lot, uh, but it's a real guttural type of, uh, type of language. Um, and, and there you have it. God's a, see, you, you're repelled by it. Ooh, that's gross. Right, you got it. That's how God views our good works, thinking we're going to go to heaven. That's gross. You disgust me. All right, so salvation isn't found by our good works. It's not by the good that we do. So what, what does it mean then to believe in Jesus? This is really important that you understand this. To believe in Jesus is not mere intellectual belief. That's not it. It's not even, it's not even believing that Jesus is your Savior. That won't do either. That will not suffice. To believe in Jesus means to repent from your sin, to ask God for forgiveness, and then to trust in Christ alone for salvation. Repent means you turn from your sin and turn to Christ. And we see this very clearly in at least in two passages. Mark 1, 14 through 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Then in verse 15 of Mark 1, we see what the declaration is. We see what the gospel is. Here's it. Here it goes. Jesus says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Romans 10, 9-10, very well-known text. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. When Paul wrote those words in Romans 10, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he was not simply saying, oh yeah, you, you, you just say the words, Jesus is Lord, and you're good to go. That's not it. The word kurios means Lord. It means master. It's a master-slave relationship. It's the kind of allegiance that the Roman emperors during the time that the New Testament was written demanded of their subjects. As you know, maybe you remember from your, your history classes, the Roman emperors got to the point where they actually believed they were divine. They got to the point where they actually believed they were God. Therefore, if you're going to be a good Roman citizen, you're going to, you're going to declare your allegiance to the curios, to the Lord, who is the Roman emperor. And this is one of the things that put Christianity immediately on the outskirts of Roman society and Roman culture. This is one of the things that made Ro uh, Christians an enemy of the state because they did not declare that Caesar was curios. They declared that Jesus is curios. Caesar's not Lord. Christ is Lord. So this confession that Christ is Lord is not just words leaving your mouth. You're not just saying things. To declare that Jesus is Lord is to live as if Christ is your master and you are his slave. And as you read through the New Testament, you will see this language of slavery again and again. You'll hear things like Paul, a slave of God. In Romans 6, you are slaves of righteousness. 
And the English translations, again, they kind of they chicken out. They use words like bondservant. But the word, the original wording is doulos. Doulos does not mean paid for slave. Doulos means owned slave. You are owned by another. Which brings to light con- verses like, you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Workers are employed. Slaves are owned. You were purchased by the blood of Christ. It's crucial then that you understand the nature of true belief. Go wrong here at the nature of belief, what belief means, and you can easily fall into the trap of easy believism or free grace theology. The idea here is that the only thing that you need to do in order to believe a Christian or to become a Christian is just simply believe. Just believe. Just believe that Jesus is God and you are good to go. Repentance, they would say, is not part of the equation. They, they would even go so far as to say that repentance is a work. They would say that, that, the, that the historic Orthodox Christian position that repentance is necessary for salvation, they would call that a heresy. But as we've seen, true faith, true belief is repentance and trust. They're, they're two sides of the same coin. You repent from your your sin and you trust in Christ. We call that belief. Call that belief. What happens when you separate repentance and trust and you just call it belief is you create false converts. This is especially destructive because not only is it false conversion, but it gives false converts false assurance. Of course you're saved. You said a prayer when you were five years old and you meant it. Look, it's written on your Bible. Whenever you doubt, open up your Bible. Look, it has the date written on it when you said the prayer. You said the sinner's prayer, therefore you're good. I've been told this before. I used to struggle with with doubting. Am I truly saved or am I not? And I was told, open up your Bible. Look, there it is. The date you were saved. Or maybe, maybe someone says, well, you know, uh, 20 years ago, I walked some aisle. I was in a revival and I walked some aisle. I cried. I felt emotionally moved. I made some profession of faith. And there you go. I am saved. The thing is, the Bible nowhere says that you are saved by a prayer that you said as a five-year-old or by walking down an aisle. The emphasis in the New Testament to test whether or not someone is truly saved, is not focused on some past event. You said the sinner's prayer, you walked an aisle. No, no. The focus of the New Testament is, what is your present condition? Like, right now, what is your life like? What you intellectually believe, the facts you believe, really are not relevant. James 2.19. You believe that God is one. You do well. So, so James says, good, I, I'm glad you have right orthodox understanding of God's nature. But then he, here comes the punch. He says, even the demons believe and they shudder. So what you believe about God will not determine your fate. Mere belief saves no one. What we do, how we live, that demonstrates whether or not we have truly believed. How we live demonstrates whether or not Our salvation is real. James 2.18. Someone will say, you have faith, I have works. This is James' response. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. The things that we do reveals whether or not we truly believe. Because belief, again, is not just head knowledge. It's not just, yes, check the box, Jesus is God. Check the box. Jesus died for my sins. I believe that. That's not saving faith. The question is, are you right now in your life presently bearing fruit that accompanies repentance? Luke 6, 43 through 44. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. 
The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of the evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of, his, of the heart, his mouth speaks. Do you, know what, do you know what's being said there? Do you know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying the fruit you bear reveals what you are. It reveals what kind of tree you are. You can say you're a Christian, but if you're not living like it, if your world, if your lifestyle is dominated by sin, Jesus says, I don't care what kind of tra- tree you're claiming to be. You're not saved. You're not saved. You're just not. John 15, 8, Jesus says this. Well, verse 7 to verse 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and this will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. John 15, 8. The fruit you bear will prove whether or not you are a true follower of Christ or a false follower of Christ. Listen to how the Apostle John talks about people who profess to be saved. They say they're Christians, but the way they live doesn't fit with what they're saying. John 3, 4 through 10. Or 1 John, 1 John 3, 4 through 10. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he, Jesus, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. And no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason why the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. See what the Apostle John is writing there? He says that if you are making a practice of sinning, you're not saved. You are a child of the devil. Make a practice of sinning. If, If you can look at your life and legitimately say, Sin is dominating my entire life. I could be characterized simply by my sin. I am just a wicked, horrible, wretched person. I live just as wickedly as everyone. There is no difference between me and people who are not saved. Guess what? Regardless of what you believe, regardless of a prayer you said as a kid, regardless of you getting dunked in a tank of water, you're not saved. Bottom line. It's that black and white. The Apostle John is that black. And why? Which is funny that they would call the Apostle John the, the Apostle of Love. Like everyone talks about John, like, oh, he's just so loving. And he just, oh. But John says some, like, some of the clearest, like, black and white things in the entire New Testament. So, this, this whole process of people saying with their lips, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I'm going to heaven, I believe Jesus died for me, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but living just as wickedly as everyone else, having sin dominate their life. This is contemporary evangelicalism. There are thousands, thousands of people who claim that they are Christians, say that they are saved, but they live in a way that is no different than anyone else. They claim to be regenerate. They claim to be saved. They claim to have the Holy Spirit residing within, but live just as wickedly as everyone else, all of you in this room know Christians like this. They say one thing, they live another. They profess one thing, but they behave in a different way. They may even come on Sunday morning. They may sing, clap their hands, raise their hands, cry, be into it, amen, hallelujah, out the door, living just as worldly as everyone else. They're not saved. They're not. 
They're not. The Bible's clear. Now, what we're talking about here, this is my qualifier, is we're talking about direction. We're not talking about perfection. There, you, you, if you are a sinner, or if you're a sinner, if you are a Christian, if you are saved, you will continue to sin. Don't misunderstand me. We're not talking about perfection. We're talking about direction. What is the direction of your life? Is your life being dominated by the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit? If you want to know one paragraph in the New Testament that will help you to determine whether or not you are truly saved, it's Galatians 5, 19 through 23. Galatians 5, 19 through 23, and I'll read it to you. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So as I read through that list, does, do any of those attributes define you? Do any of those things, as I read through that, do you say, yeah, that's my life. My entire life is sexual immorality. My entire life is uh, jealousy or, or fits of anger. When people talk about me, they, 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 they talk about me as being fundamentally an angry person. That's who I am. That is the essence of my being. If as I read through that list, any of those things really impressed upon you and you said, hmm, that defines my life. You have good grounds to, to question whether or not you're truly saved. And in fact, Paul will tell the Corinthians that this is something that they should do. Question. See, prove, test yourselves, is what Paul says. Test yourselves. Here's the good news. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So the question to ask yourself is, is my life, and, all, and you would know best, right? You and your spouse. Is my life more works of the flesh or fruit of the Spirit? Again, we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about direction. Are you increasing in holiness? Can you look back and say, well, yeah, I, I, I've seen growth in my own life. We're not talking about perfection. We're not talking about this. This is a lifelong thing. Sanctification takes the entirety of life. But, the, but if your life is dominated by any of those works of the flesh, if you could characterize your entire life as being that, then you have good grounds to question yourself. We see that the, the nature of salvation is conditioned upon believing in Jesus. And believing in Jesus consists of repenting from sin and trusting in Christ alone for salvation. Those who are truly saved will have fruit that validates, or as John 15, 8 says, proves that they are truly followers of Christ. Now look what Jesus says here. Look at, look at verse, uh, we're still in verse 47. Look what Jesus says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Did you notice that the word has is, is present? It, it doesn't say whoever believes will have future life. It says whoever believes has future life. Like right now you have future life. Life, eternal life. When you believe in Jesus, you aren't waiting for eternal life to begin. It's not as though you have to wait to die until you experience that eternal life. At your conversion, at the moment you repent of your sin, at the moment you ask God for forgiveness and trust in him alone for your salvation, at that moment, your eternal life begins. If you are a Christian right now, you are enjoying the incredible benefits that you will begin to fully enjoy for all of eternity, like knowing God. Believers alone have the distinct privilege of knowing God. Not knowing facts about God. Not knowing things about God. Unbelievers know a lot of things about God. Unbelievers know things so true about God, they'll even mock God. Oh, one little sin is enough to damn me to hell? Hmm, okay, what kind of God is that? That's a truth. That is a truth, by the way. One little sin is enough to damn you to hell for eternity. See, they're staying true. They know facts to be true 
about God. So we're not talking here about knowing facts about God. We're talking here about knowing God. Knowing Him personally. Having a relationship with Him. This is, if you are truly regenerate, if you are truly a Christian, this is your special privilege. John 17, 3. This is Jesus speaking. This is eternal life. That those who say the sinner's prayer go to heaven and escape from hell and play their harps all day long. That's not what it says. It's not what it says at all. Jesus says, this is, get this, this is eternal life. Because so often that's exactly how we present the gospel, is it not? Like, you're going to go to hell, repent or burn, turn or burn, right? Uh, I just saw a horrible church sign not long ago, and it's like, it says, uh, receive the bread of life or you'll be toast. That is so <laughs> cringy, so cringy, horrible. But, but that's, that's how we present the gospel. That's not how Jesus described the gospel. Listen, listen to him, John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. According to Jesus, eternal life is not fire insurance. Eternal life is not escaping from hell and going to heaven and playing a harp and sitting on a cloud. That is not eternal life. Eternal life is that they, us, those who truly follow him, that they know you. Eternal life is knowing God, having that relationship with God. Jeremiah 9, 23-24, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this that he knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in, these, in the earth. For these things I delight, declares the Lord. Your boast as a Christian is not that you live better than everyone else, because frankly, you probably don't. You try and you mess up, but at least you're trying. Your boast as a Christian is not that you come to church every Sunday. That's not your boast. Your boast as a Christian is not all the good things that you do. Oh, you know, we do this, we do this. Oh, I'm such a great person. No, no, no. Your boast as a Christian is that you can know God, that you can have a relationship with God. That is your privilege. That is your privilege that the unbelieving world around you does not have. Hosea 6.6 reveals God's heart. Sometimes we come to church thinking, ah, I go to church, I'll give my money, I'll give my time, I'll give my energy, and that's what God wants, that's going to make God happy. Listen to Hosea 6.6. This is God speaking. He says, for I desire love and not sacrifice. He desires that his people would know him. Like, that's what he wants. Come to church, yes. Give your money, sure, yes. Give your time, yes. Do all the things that the Bible tells you to do, yes. But fundamentally, what God wants of you is not your actions, not your rituals, not the things that you do. He wants your heart. He wants your affections. He wants you to know him, to have this relationship with him. You were made for this end. Verse 48, look what Jesus says. He says, I am the bread of life. This is now the fifth time in this chapter that Jesus says he is the bread of life of life. And as we've seen, as we've worked our way through this entire chapter, salvation is at the forefront here. And in order to, to, so Jesus has been thus far talking about eternal life. He's been, been talking about salvation. He's been talking about what that means. And he gives us this illustration, bread of life, to, 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 to give us a visible representation of this. To, 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 he's speaking here in a metaphor. You guys remember what a metaphor is? You remember from your English class, metaphor? Metaphor is a communication device. Some of you are already checking out, I know. A metaphor is a communication device that, uh, uh, that where you speak of something in a way that isn't literal. 
Uh, in other words, you speak in this way to communicate a truth. You, you speak figuratively, figurative speech. And, and you say, well, ah, metaphor, what are you talking about? Like, but here's the thing. All of us speak in metaphors all the time. Like all of us. All of us use metaphors all the time, everyday language. We're, we, we speak about things that, that aren't literally true, but we're either exaggerating or we're, 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 we're saying one thing as a means of comparison to communicate something, okay? You get that? Uh, uh, you may call someone, for instance, a couch potato. By this, you don't mean that they are literally a potato. Uh, you're not declaring, Devin, you are a potato. Like, clearly, he is not a potato. He is a human being. He has hair. He has glasses. His fingers. Potatoes don't have fingers. He draws. Potatoes do not draw. You're not declaring he is literally a potato. What you are doing is you are saying, sorry, Devin, when you call someone a, a, a couch potato, you are saying that they are lazy, that like a potato, they just sit there and do nothing. Couch potato. Or you may say something like, um, it's raining cats and dogs. Now, this one's interesting. The origin here is twofold. One was saying like, um, Cats and dogs used to like be on the rooftops, and when it would rain really hard, they would slip off the roofs and fall. So it would literally be raining cats and dogs. And then another one would be like cats and dogs died, and they just left their bodies in the streets. And so like when the waters, when it would rain a lot, it would just like cats and dogs would just kind of like come down the sidewalks. Whatever. The, the origin story is a little weird, but here's the idea. When we talk about raining cats and dogs, nobody's like literally saying dogs and cats are falling from the sky. What we mean by that is that there's a lot of rain coming down. It's like cats and dogs. It's, it's heavy. The drops are big, whatever. It's coming down. There's a lot of it. Music, artistic expression, it is filled with metaphors, right? We all get this. Your, your six-year-old who watches cars and hears life is a highway, you immediately get it, right? Like that, 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 that song, get, that's a metaphor. That song is a metaphor. Uh, there, there's a comparison between living and driving down the highway, Driving down the highway, there's a lot of things that are going to happen to you. You might run out of gas. Uh, you might, uh, your tire might blow out. Uh, you might uh, uh, hit the embankment and die, and that's it. Okay, so it is with life. Like, there's a lot of things that go on in life, right? We, we, have, we, have, different, we have different setbacks. Therefore, life is like a highway, okay? Uh, or you may have heard the great philosopher Katy Perry singing, because baby, you're a firework. Come on, show them what you're worth. Make them go, oh, 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 as you shoot across the sky, right? Firework, very popular song. And as you hear firework, you get it. The idea is clear. She's not literally, this is not a 4th of July anthem. Katy Perry is not literally singing about fireworks. Here's what she's saying. Fireworks are bright. Fireworks are impressive. You can see them clearly in the night sky. And you are like a firework. You're bright. You're impressive. Shine for all to see. That's what Katy Perry is saying. It's a metaphor. Um, I originally was going to use Coldplay, not Katy Perry, because I like, like, who knows what Coldplay's singing about half the time? Because it's metaphors, right? But I think you get the point. Jesus here is speaking in metaphor language. He is using metaphors, the bread of life, to express what salvation is like. And that is crucial to understand. Misunderstand the metaphor, and you're going to be where the Roman Catholic Church is at, which is Jesus is literally the bread of life. And in order to receive him, you literally have to consume him. You have to eat Jesus. You have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And you do this at the Eucharist, where, Jesus, where the elements, the, body and the, wine, the bread and the wine, literally come the, the body and the blood of Jesus. And if you want to go to heaven, if you want to do this, you have to perform the sacraments. One of the sacraments is this one. This is a high sacrament. You consume his flesh, you drink his blood, you receive him, and then you will go to heaven. Do you, do you see how not understanding the metaphor will, go, will get you completely off the track? And before you know it, you're preaching a false gospel. But Jesus here calls himself the bread of life. And the bread of life really is a perfect metaphor because it's speaking it's universally to all people at all times. Hunger is the universal condition of humanity. Every person who has ever lived, unless they have some sort of defect, has the craving to eat. It's built into us. All of us 
feel discomfort and we feel that, that achiness if we don't eat. And if we go long enough without eating, we will die. All, and all of us feel that immediately difference when we do eat. The, the discomfort goes away. The ache goes away. We don't, we don't die. Um, you know, Snickers capitalized on this, right? You're not yourself when you're hungry or whatever. Um, that's a universal condition. Everyone is hungry. Everyone needs food to, leave, to live. Everyone needs food to survive. You, you need food just to even feel well, right? Like you, you're not yourself when you're hungry. We've all seen the memes, right? When, when Bay is hungry and she's like this demon. And then it's like when Bay, you know, when the girl gets fed or whatever, and she's like this cute little cuddable, cuddable thing, whatever. But, but Jesus taps into this and, and he, he masterfully calls himself the bread of life. He is what everyone is craving. He is what everyone needs. He is what everyone is looking for. He is what is necessary to live. He is what you need to survive. And here's the thing. Everyone knows that, even if they don't know it. Make sense? What I mean by that is every person yearns for something just beyond their reach. Every person longs for fulfillment and for meaning and for happiness. And, and Jesus is that something beyond their reach. Jesus is that fulfillment. He is that meaning and he is that happiness. They just don't know it. Experientially, they're living it. Something is missing. I don't know what that is. Answer, bread of life. I am hungry. So I'm going to fill my life with drugs or alcohol or sex or relationships or living for whatever event. But they're left empty. They're left hungry because Jesus is the bread of life. He's what they're living for. He's what they're longing for, even if they don't know he is. Jesus here is declaring that he is the answer. He is the food that everyone is desperately looking for. He is the bread of life. And as the bread of life, he's in charge. He gives life to whom he wills, as we've seen. And he himself sets the terms for receiving the bread of life. If people are going to receive eternal life, they must partake of the bread of life. D.A. Carson puts it this way. He says, Jesus' invitation strips the would-be disciples of all pretensions, of all self-congratulation, of all the agendas, save those laid down by Jesus himself. Those who believe in a context like this cannot approach Jesus as if they're doing him a favor, or worse, as if they know what is best for him. They must believe, but they do so on his terms and by his grace. Jesus as the bread of life, is superior than any physical bread that this life can offer. Any physical nourishment, any fulfillment, any satisfaction or enjoyment that this world offers is temporary and fleeting. Any religion and any teaching that says that you can have eternal life apart from Christ and apart from his terms of salvation, submission to Lordship, to his lordship and repentance and faith, that will lead to death. Jesus makes this point in the very next verse. Look with me at verse 49. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that way no one may eat of it, so that way one may eat of it and not die. Jesus never losing an occasion to insult his opponents. He throws some shade here. Look what he says. He tells the Jews, he says, Your fathers ate bread and died. As in not mine. You see what he's doing there? Jesus is a Jew just like them. But he's saying, your fathers ate bread and they died. So he's, 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 he's they, remember, they, they viewed themselves as being God's special people. And Jesus is telling them, you're not. You're not special. You're not even God's own people. Jesus says, my God is God the Father. Your, fa- your fathers are the ones who ate bread, ate man in the wilderness, and died. That's who your fathers are. And again, Jesus contrasts the bread and life that he offers with the bread and life that the Jews received during Moses' day. Their bread was manna, and it was temporary. His bread is himself and is forever. They ate and died, but those who eat, in quotation marks, we're speaking metaphorically here, Those who eat Jesus, those who receive Jesus, 
They will not die. Verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Jesus restates in verse 51 what he just said in verse 50, but he puts it in a positive way. So verse 50, eat this bread and do not die. Verse 51, eat this bread and live forever. Do you see he's, he's saying the same thing in two different ways. Jesus is the living bread. He must be metaphorically eaten. What I mean is he must be received. These Jews were familiar with the entire Old Testament. These Jews were expecting the Messiah. These Jews had a lot of head knowledge about God. But intellectual assent isn't enough. Jesus must be received. John MacArthur writes, People may admire Christ, be impressed with his teaching, and even bemoan his death on the cross as a great tragedy. But not until they appropriate him by faith do they become one with him. Next phrase. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. One of the really crucial interpretive questions that we, we must ask ourselves as we work through John 6 is the meaning of the word flesh. And I don't want to focus too, too much on this because we're, really this is like the main substance of next week's text. But I'll just give you, I'll just give you a teaser, okay? Give you a teaser. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, I mentioned them earlier, they take our passage, this phrase from our, our text today, and, and next week's text, verse 52 through verse 59, as the basis for their flawed teaching of the Eucharist and transubstantiation. Uh, Eucharist is their, is, their, is their expression of the Lord's Supper. Okay? They don't call it, sometimes they'll call it communion. They don't call it the Lord's Supper like we do. They call it the Eucharist because they're getting the word uh, um, from Luke 22, 19 and 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, Jesus gave thanks. It's the Greek word eukachristen. So he gave eukachristen, Eucharist. Do you see that? Very simple. So, so that's, it's, their, it's their idea of communion. Transubstantiation, that's a fancy word, but basically it just means this. The elements of the Lord's Supper actually become the body and the blood of Christ. That's, that's what they believe. I'm not making this up. Their own uh, catechism, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in par- paragraph 1333 says this, At the heart of the Eucharistic Yuka- celebration, that's the communion, are the bread and the wine that by the word of Christ and the invocation of the Holy Spirit become Christ's body and blood. So if you were, if you were in a Catholic church this morning, you would have the Mass. The Mass is, is, is two parts. You have, the, you have the, the liturgy of the word, and then you have the Eucharist. Okay, that's, that's where they do all of the, the things that they do, all of the enchanting that they do, and they think that the elements actually become the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. This understanding, however, couldn't be more wrong. And again, we're going to see this more clearly next week, but just, just, I, just, I just want to share with you why we know that this, their understanding is erroneous. First off, the, the entire context here is discussion of salvation. That's the whole theme of the bread of life discourse is salvation. We've seen it clear as day. John 6, 29, believe in him. John 6, 40, believe in him, have eternal life. John 6, 47, whoever believes has eternal life. There is no discussion here about the Eucharist. John 6 has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper or with communion. Again, why? Because bread of life is not to be taken literally. Remember? metaphor. It is a metaphor. Jesus is illustrating his teaching of salvation with this concept of bread. Andreas Kostenberger, who's one of the top, top dogs in John's studies, if you want to know someone who like, is the man when it comes to, to John, uh, Yohannan scholar Andreas Kostenberger, he, he gives us further evidence that this is not talking about the Eucharist. Uh, the first is very obvious. You, you want to hear it? The Jews wouldn't have understood Jesus' words in the context of sacrament. Why? Because the Lord's Supper wasn't even instituted yet. There was no Lord's Supper. So why would Jesus be talking to them about the Lord's Supper when that's not going to come until the final night of his life 
when he institutes it with the Last Supper. There was no Lord's Supper. It makes no sense. And they would have been like, what? Huh? Number two, nowhere, and this is a little bit more technical, nowhere in the New Testament is the word flesh used with the Lord's Supper. The, the word Jesus used here is, is sarx, flesh. Every passage in the New Testament that talks about the, the body of Christ uses the word soma, which is body, body. So how we interpret the word of flesh really is, not, it's not just a matter of semantics here. We're not just, we're not just saying, ah, well, you know, you know, we're just you know, picking on the Catholics. That's not what we're doing here. Like, this is life and death. This is the difference between true gospel and false gospel. Okay? The, the gospel message, as we have seen so clearly in John's gospel, is that the good works that you do, the things that you do, contribute nothing to your salvation. And it's interesting that in John 6, verse 63, so later on in the passage we're in, Jesus is going to say, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The flesh is no help at all. So what does Jesus mean when he talks about his flesh? Well, he's talking about literally being a human being, John 1.14. And the word became, here's our word again, sarx. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory is of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. When we talk about Jesus being the flesh, we're talking about his sacrifice for the world. Romans 8.3, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. When Jesus says that he is the flesh, he's giving his flesh for the life of the world, he's talking about his sacrificial death on the cross. He's talking about the atonement, which would not be possible if he was a spirit. You don't nail a spirit to a cross, but you nail a human being to a cross. You don't shed a spirit's blood. A spirit has no blood. The Bible tells us that sin's payment is the shedding of blood. You shed flesh to get blood. Clearly, the language of flesh doesn't communicate the Lord's Supper, doesn't communicate communion, it doesn't communicate Eucharist. This is language of sacrifice. And here we meet another profound reality of God's plan of salvation. Look what Jesus says. This bread that he gives is for the life of the world. This sacrificial death is for all of the world. Some people try to read into this verse and other verses the, the, the idea that world doesn't mean all people at all times. It means all kinds of people, Jew and Greek, slave or free, male or female, rich or poor. But that's not it. Jesus is very clearly saying that he is, his death is for the whole world. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Christ's death for, for the world is taught all throughout the New Testament. Romans 5, 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, Adam's sin damned us all, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. Adam's sin damns us all. Jesus' atonement provides for the possibility of all of us. See the logic there? 2 Corinthians 5, 14-15. For the love of God controls us because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live may no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Hebrews 2, 9. We see him who was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation. He is the sin payment for our sins, the believers. And not for our sins only, John writes, but for the sins of the whole world. Christ's death was not just for the elect. It was for all. Listen to what Peter writes in 2 Peter 2.1. But false prophets also rose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who secretly bring in destructive heresies. Listen. Even denying the master who bought them. They are 
Peter continues, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Peter says, there are false teachers out there who will go to hell. They're bringing upon themselves destruction. They deny the master who bought them. Bought them. Clearly, the New Testament very clearly teaches that Christ's death was for all. We, but we know that all will not be saved. So how do we wrestle with this? Well, we have a, a nice cliche that you can put in your pocket and, and just hang on to it. Here it is. Christ's death on the cross was sufficient for the whole world, but efficient only for the elect. Sufficient for all, efficient only for those who believe. All are savable, all can be saved, but only the, the elect will be saved. Only, only those whom God draws will come to faith in Christ. Okay? Two, two thoughts in regards, in, in way of conclusion. If, number one, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one. You need to repent. Okay? Very clearly. The, the, we've seen here the gospel very clearly presented in these few verses. And if you are a believer, the gospel has real ramifications for you. As believers, if we aren't intentional, if we aren't intentional about maintaining our communion with God, about focusing on, on, on Christ's cross, we will find ourselves in a position where we lose the wonder of it all. Our hearts will grow cold. We won't see the gospel as the glorious, awesome plan of God, whereby, whereby before the foundation of the world, he, according to his foreknowledge, elected individuals to salvation. And that these chosen ones, he predestined to adoption into his very own family and into conformity of his son's own likeness. These he calls, he regenerates, giving them a new heart. A heart that's oriented towards obeying God, towards delighting in him. These he declares righteous because they're covered in the blood of Christ and robed in the righteousness of God. And as they live, they become more like Christ and one day will be glorified and their conformity to Christ will be complete. I didn't just recite to you the ordo salutis, the, the order of salvation, just some dry theology to, to, for whatever purpose, to make you feel smart or whatever. This is your life. Christian, it, it, this is you. This is your story. Romans 8, 28 through 29 is your story. Justification saves you from sin's payment. Sanctification saves you from sin's power. And glorification will save you from sin's presence. The gospel is your good news, and it's not meant simply as an entrance to the Christian life, although it's not less than that. The gospel is something that you must return to every day. It is your ground of existence. It's your surety. It's your daily reminder. Uh, John Owen, the great Puritan, said, contemplate the cross of Christ every single day. Glory afresh in the gospel. This morning, we've barely scratched the surface in regards to the conversation of eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood. As we've seen, this kind of metaphorical language is not easily understood. It's, it's pro, you, very, go wrong and you will, you will get wrong in a real place. The, the original audience was confused by this kind of talk of eating Jesus' flesh, of drinking his blood. And we're going to look next time more in depth as to what Jesus means when he says those things. So we'll look at that next week. John 6, 52 through 59. But let's pray. Father, this morning we, we have seen so clearly the gospel message. We, we see that Jesus is the bread of life, that he is the fulfillment of everything that we're longing for. We see that if we want to, if we want to enjoy fellowship with you, we must consume him. We must, we must receive him. So God, I pray if there's anyone in here who is not a believer, that you would draw them to yourself, that you would save them. And for those of us who are believers, God, that you would have us never lose the wonder of the cross, that we would constantly, every day, behold your gospel, that we would glory in your gospel, that the gospel would never become boring to us or dry, but God, that we would see the gospel as something that radically changes us every day that we live in the shadow of your cross with the hope of our redemption, being sanctified by your Spirit. So God, these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.